Welcome to Resiliency Radio, your go-to podcast for the most cutting-edge insights in functional and integrative medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Jill, and in each episode, we delve deep into the heart of healing and personal transformation. Join us as we connect with renowned experts, thought leaders, and innovators who are at the forefront of medical research and practice, empowering you with knowledge and inspiration and aiding you in your optimal healing journey. Hey guys, it's out. If you haven't seen it yet, our documentary, which has been years in the process of making, is out now at drpatientmovie.com. You can rent it, watch it, share it with friends. And I would love to hear if you've already seen it, how it's impacting and inspiring you in your healing journey. Today, we have a special episode. We've been doing these special episodes about the making of the movie, kind of a behind the scenes glimpse into some of the characters and some of the themes and things that come up in the movie. And today I am beyond honored to have my special guest, Dr. Eileen Naomi Rusk, who is not only a brilliant neuropsychologist, I'll give you just a brief history, a brief bio, but also a dear, dear and precious friend. Dr. Rusk is co-director of the Healthy Brain Program in Colorado and coordinator of the Rehab and Trauma Treatment Programs. She's also a neuropsychologist in Ontario, Canada, and has a PhD from the University of Brigham in England in psychology and neuropsychology, neuropsychopharmacology, and has authored numerous papers in the areas of psychology, neuropsychology, neuropharmacology, neuroscience, and diverse as cerebral palsy in children, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and so many more. As you can see, she is truly an expert. There's so much more to her bio, but I want to get down to the topic. And today we actually just talked before coming on here. We're going to give you a glimpse into having coffee with Dr. Carnahan and Dr. Rusk and just how we talk when we're out hiking and on the trails about life and about trauma and about real um, things that are impacting you if you're suffering from chronic and complex illness. And um, in order to kind of set the, the tone for this, First of all, welcome, Dr. Rusk. Thanks so much for joining me today. I'm delighted, thrilled. I'm so happy that, you know, today's the day that the movie is out there and exposed and everyone's going to have a, a big thrill when they see it. It's deep. It's beautiful. It's aesthetically beautiful. It's creative. And it's a gorgeous story of resilience. So I'm happy to be here beyond Thank you. And some of the things we're going to talk about is like fear of like, here I am, I'm putting my story really out there and I'm excited too. I'm so, it's so a long time in coming, but there is also an exposure. And I think some patients go through that as well as a, whether they get brave enough to tell their story or share, or even just dealing with a new diagnosis. Um, let's watch this clip and then we can start to dive into the discussion about some of these themes. I can't believe I'm back at Loyola. Uh, walking up to this place today was so surreal. Uh, everything just came flooding back. And the very first time I came here was for an interview. And I think I didn't really believe I could be a doctor. And I remember seeing that Strict school of medicine and the surrealness. This was probably my first interview. I don't remember any other interviews before that. And thinking about, wow, could I really come here? Could I really learn medicine? Do I really have what it takes? And um, today, coming back here, all of that feeling came flooding back. There's been certain things in my life I've been able to just kind of block out and forget. And there was some beautiful, beautiful experiences here. But there's a lot of hard stuff here, too. It's so emotional to be here. And it's this beautiful... combination of absolute joy and pride and gratitude and sadness <laughs> for that girl who had to be brave, had to show up day after day, and had to be tough, had to take care of her family, finish medical school, 
and never really let anyone know how much it hurt and how much she was afraid. I don't think I ever said that I was afraid of dying, ever. But the truth is I was at times. <laughs> I don't think I ever really let myself feel that fear. I just pushed it away and went on to performing the dancing bear, we call it. <laughs> I was really good at being a dancing bear and performing and not letting anyone know how terrified I was. Ooh. <laughs> oh, goodness. Right? Now watching that, I have to tell you, this is a scene that came last back into the movie and I called it the ugly cry scene and it took me a lot to be able to say, okay, I, I, I'm okay with that in the movie. Because as you can see, like there is, that scene was not rehearsed. There was no script. It was me walking into the medical school and like everything came rushing back. I felt everything and I felt everything that I hadn't felt as a 20 something that had to keep things together. Let's talk about that. Like from your perspective, you've seen this, you've had clients like dealing with chronic illness. Um, I just love to hear your thoughts because there's so many thoughts that are going through my head about whether, how do we get through really difficult circumstances and maybe suppress that, but then how do we come back and feel it and the fears? I'd love kind of some comments on, on what you see in that scene as far as the universality of human suffering. Yeah, really. And, you know, the deal you and I made off camera was minimize the cognitive mind piece about it and talk about our heart our yeah. heart yes. and, our feelings and our experiences and I just want to say if we go if we just go back to that go to the my somatic interoceptive emotional experience when I saw that again was the same I've seen this a number of times but it's like new and I think what you're saying is like even seeing it again Jill it was like new for you too Yes, it always is. It's still hard to see that. It's still hard. And I feel like it's, it's, you said so many things in those few words. And again, like I want the viewers to know that this isn't rehearsed. This is your impulse intuition coming with mine. Yes. I, my, when I was noticing you, can I just share? Please be very, very free here. Cause I want to be, I want to come from, we just even like said a little prayer before and said, we want to come from our heart because I know the listener, we both have great knowledge <laughs> and you can share that so eloquently. And, and so can I, but today, if you're listening, we want to come in the heart space. And if you're listening, I want this to resonate with you wherever you are to maybe give you a little piece of hope. So yeah, go up, go on to say what you were thinking when you saw feeling again your invitation i want to i want to support your invitation to invite whoever's listening to this yes not a healing crisis whether you're on a healing journey right now and it's chronic and i know many of our shared patients and listeners have uh, experienced suffering and pain in themselves in a loved one or there's fear around it or there's fear embedded in it so just paying attention to that where you might find um like a glimmer and a glow within our conversation today that's my my public wish and prayer um about getting back to the actual like experience of seeing you like approach the doors and then walk into the auditorium you know watching you talk about it was really interesting because it's the first time i noticed your eye movements and i'm really into eye movements right like i just gave a talk on the vagus nerve and i'm i was so I was so interested that when you talked about the past, your eye movement went like up to the left. And then when you were in, in, in the present moment talking to the person you were talking to, you were like right here. And so I just want to speak to how like so often we can have both at the same time, right? We could have a, a flooding of memories that we're like not even aware of that there's this whole past back here, but still be in the present moment. So just noticing that it's pretty cool that we're always being influenced by this, these implicit, like unconscious things that you got and you use this word like twice flooded by, yes. you were flooded by this, 
whole home, a whole vista of memories that you're like, oh my God, I can't believe they came so fast. Yeah. But just notice that your eye gaze was like up to the left. And when we, it's good, it's just good to notice that then when we're looking for a memory or we're feeling something, especially in like some trauma healing techniques that you know, our eyes kind of move to a certain point. Right. I noticed that in you, which was very cool because I, I, I hadn't noticed that before. Wow. And you had some, you know, flashbacks. I mean, clearly, you know, I say with a, yeah. a very present part with you, you, you had a trauma you never knew was trauma and you never knew was trauma. You yes. Know, events that only, uh, it's only been recent that, you know, I say to you sometimes, this is huge trauma. This is shock trauma. This is, I thought I was going to medical school and then I was the youngest person to get diagnosed with like a life-threatening cancer. Yeah. Uh, I can't really, how do I do both? How, how do I do both? This? Oh, I think I'll compartmentalize. Right, right. So I don't mean to talk so much, but so that's what we do with, with the stress and trauma. We compartmentalize. Yeah. Think, okay, this is safe back there or that's safe yeah. back there. And then these implicit memories that show up in our tears yeah. or, you know, collapse or our depression or our flooding. They're like, oh my God, they were always there. And you got all these cues, right? The sensory cue of, yeah. well, I mean, I just imagine you opening the door and looking into this huge auditorium and like, oh my God, I, I'm, I'm emotional as I imagine you doing it. Like both are true. Yes. I almost died. And I was just starting medical school. Yeah. You're describing it so well because, um, and, and like you said, for me, that experience of filming, I had no idea that flood would come and that they'd capture it on camera. And then in the first few drafts of the film, we're like, no, don't show that part. Right. But of course that's the humanity. Of course we need to show that part because we're all human. And that's probably the part more than maybe any other that really resonates with people who have suffered because they're like, oh like with the humanity, the suffering, those are the points where we connect with others because that's the reality of our lives versus like, well, we have it all together or I've overcome cancer. Like those aren't the stories that resonate. The stories that resonate are, I suffered, I did overcome, but it was still hard. And I'm telling that story there of like, and and in the telling, it's like me literally reliving. Um, I love that you said compartmentalization because I think there's this piece of, we always say, oh, this is trauma, 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 it's all bad. The truth is like that got me through medical school. And I'd love for you to talk about like, how do we cope with those things? Because what I did is I'm like, okay, cancer, you know, and I got to be tough and I got to be strong and I got to overcome. And somehow that allowed me to get through medical school, raising three stepchildren and cancer and chemo and all that. But now looking back, I'm 40 something, I was 25. I can look back with the compassion of an older, wiser woman and say, oh, sweetheart. I can't believe what you went through. And so we can, let's talk a little bit about that. How can we actually go back to our younger selves that have experienced pain and trauma and either reparent or relove or like give this compassion? It's almost like the timeline becomes continuous of our current self and our old self. And you taught me this. And how do we go back and actually give that love and compassion to those parts of ourselves that did experience trauma? Because yes, we can have a therapist, we can do somatic therapies, but sometimes it's as simple as giving that compassion to ourselves, right? Talk a little bit about that. How do we do that? How do, how might we frame that? Wow. You talked about two beautiful things. I just want to like tease them apart and answer okay. them, speak to them both. But the first one was like, and boy, what do we do when we compartmentalize? Like, mm -hmm. why do we do it? How do we do it? And then the second piece is, and you know it because of our relational attunement, you know that the quality of uh, acceptance and compassion and understanding, those are the medicine, I think. Those allow, they invite the opening of the door. Yes. For what was really there? And we can go slowly. But first, I want to just speak to um, and both of those are important, but to speak to our healthy, robust, inbred, endogenous stress response system. Yeah. It's fabulous. Nobody talks about it. It's great. It's, it's you stress that we, that we, that we uh, engage and captivate and say, I'm going to get through this. I'm still going to work even though. 
I'm still going to smile, even though I'm going to be resilient, even though I'm feeling a little rough or I'm really suffering, or I still need to be a caregiver, even though I'm suffering. So like bless that quality in all of us that's adaptive and loving and 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 positive stress until it becomes not positive. Yes. Adaptive stress until it collapses. Adaptive stress until we collapse. Yes. It's like, okay, but there's nothing left now. Like you didn't really have a choice when you opened the doors of that auditorium. Right. It was you know, there. It was ready to brew. I just want to say it's because you, you know, you may have cried while you were there. But it's those tears you didn't cry, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You probably have more of them to cry. Yeah. More compassion for how disconnected you were from the fear, from the fear of death. Yeah. And so that's to bring love and to bring softness and to bring understanding that this was a very adaptive um superpower and i you still have it i mean i see it every day you still have it so i want to see it as a superpower not a deficit yeah because everyone does it you know and i love that reframing because that's the key right is like we do sometimes dissociate and sometimes we do like compartmentalize but those yeah. things in the real time can be totally adaptive um and especially if we're willing to work with it later if we do get stuck or overwhelmed or or it gets I always feel like it's like a stuck flow. You probably have better um, terminology for that. But if you, if later on it becomes something that's affecting you, then of course, working with that. But at the time it can be kind of a good survival mechanism. That's right. And the fear of death. Yeah. Yeah. Talk a little about that. You have a deep expertise and experience in dealing with this. And I'll tell you, I think we talked about before, but um, that came out of my mouth. I hadn't planned to say it. And I don't know if I've ever in my entire life said out loud that I was afraid to die. So to me, that was almost like to shock to myself to hear it, but it's true, of course, like, right. Um, and so how do, how do you see people dealing with, as they deal with chronic illness, everyone has to have that little piece of their mind saying, well, what if you die from this? How have you experienced that with clients or patients or, or just seems like such a big thing and something maybe we don't talk about enough? Thank you. It feels like the basis of a lot of um, why I do what I do. I actually feel like my fear of death started. I thought I'd get neurologic illness. I thought I'd have a neuropsychiatric illness. No one would understand me. I'd fall apart. I mean, my terror, my fear of these bizarre neurologic and psychological illnesses actually drove my studies. Wow. So I ended up like knowing more than the neurologists I was seeing when I was 16. Wow. So I had my own like anxiety disorder basically as a kid and my own OCD. And I was somatically preoccupied with, and that was an anxiety disorder. And that, that in that embedded in that after a lot of years of self-study and I continue to self-study, I didn't know that I was getting such, such so many somatic cues of fear and terror. And I actually was afraid of dying. Right. So that fear of my own dying led me to study. And then I became passionate and I became obsessed, but it's true. My fear of death really became my passion to study. So yeah. I really relate to this whole yeah. like conversation and we've never talked about this before. And um, I I'm talking about it because then death came to me like in different ways. I I'd, I'd be there and I'd see someone who had just attempted suicide in a car when I was 20. And then I helped someone from drowning when I was in Northern Ontario. And they just kept coming to me, right? That, that dying was near me. And yeah. I realized God, dying is really near me all the time. I better really kind of come to grips with this sphere of mine. And this isn't about me. This is about, um, no, it's really important, but I want, I want to invite the common, this conversation that is yours and mine and everyone else who's listening, this, how the fear of death shows up in so many ways in our patients, they may not say it. Yeah. Maybe like, I'm just afraid, but I can't, I'm not really sure why, but if you do enough digging, yeah. you know, and I'm very close to someone who has, who had very severe OCD and every single behavior that he did was to avoid dying. Wow. You know, so many of the illnesses that are, are the current 
chronic illnesses and psychological challenges that people have and psychiatric challenges are around fear of dying. Wow. So I'm not an expert. I just like giving lectures on dying. I always, I have started, I used to start a lecture by saying, I'm not an expert. A Zen master once said, I'm not an expert on dying because I haven't died yet. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but you know, I witnessed too. I mean, we were on a hike not too long ago and there was a tragedy that was down the road. And I mean, we've wit I witnessed you and actually multiple times where I'm like, wow, there is something really precious and crises that happen and you're there. And what's so beautiful is just like people I'm sure are experiencing now, you have this incredible capacity to transcend and to really see things from a very um, transcendent view, I guess I could say. And so you bring comfort and and I've heard this from many other people, including myself, but your, your ability to love and show unconditional love and create a space for people to be uh, felt and seen and heard is just phenomenal. So it's no wonder that you've often found yourself in those places because those are places where people in crisis need to be seen and felt, right? And you, if above all your uh, degrees and and many, many uh, experiences, one thing that you bring to this world is showing people what it feels like to be seen and to be heard. And you do that so well. <laughs> I'm just going to really thank you because I'm really, I'm very, very grateful to you. And I think that everything that you just said to me, I mean, you may not know this about yourself, but I know that people come to you in great, great states of distress, confusion, and fearing death, and maybe not having the words for it. But I know the landscape that you create for people because of what you've been through is mm -hmm. spacious. And I think because you actually, I know this for a fact, you've actually looked into your own fear of death. Yeah. The reason this is so important is because you come with a kind of equanimity to your patients and to your community. And maybe we unconsciously are all yearning for that because there's this collective fear or denial or something around death and dying. But because of the work you've done and this very poignant piece that you're pointing out in the film, I think you offer a comfort. And that's why this film is just so precious in general um, and important. So this topic of death and dying and leaning into it, you know, I started death cafes in Boulder County. You probably don't even know that. Wow. A coffee shop experience in which you talk about death and dying. Wow. <laughs> Go right to the heart of <laughs> uh, it's just have coffee and talk about dying. Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure why I'm saying this. Oh, because I, I remember learning a lot about different countries and how they hold dying, mm -hmm. the the honor and respect mm -hmm. and the presence of dying in their everyday lives lets them be happier as people. Yeah. Let, so I feel like that's that's really important to talk about that we, you know, very gently lean into our own uh, conceptions, fears, and and start the conversation around I think so, yeah. okay. I think that might be why cancer in particular I mean there's many diagnoses but cancer tends to have that idea that oh I could die from this and that's not different from any other illness however for some reason cancer has that um, emotion tied to it and I think because of that there are a lot of people who've gone through cancer and kind of touch the face of what would it look like and then come back and say I'm going to be okay, no matter what. And when you can do that, and then you can almost loan people your faith or your belief that something else is possible. And I, I love to try to do that, whether it's through the film or through the clinic, and I know you do as well. Let's shift just a little bit from death and dying in these, these difficult conversations um, to more just the trauma of experiencing what I see in my practice, and I'm sure you do too, and I'd love to have you comment on it, is people who are diagnosed with mold-related illness or Lyme disease or complex chronic post-viral syndromes, they're very, very ill. They day-to-day -day fluctuate, so they might have a good day, a bad day, so it's very unpredictable. And it's very hard to describe their illness to their friends, their family. And so they either isolate because they can't ex express to, or they can't go out and date because they can't explain it to a potential partner, or they um, tend to feel a misunderstood. Do you want to talk a little bit about how would you give encouragement to those people who are suffering from complex chronic illness and feeling this up and down, difficult explaining it to people, feeling misunderstood, feeling unseen, and they're still suffering? 
because I feel like that's at the core of so many of our patients is, is how do I really, cancer is easy. I always say cancer was way easier than mold-related illness because cancer has a name. People know what that is. I lost all my hair, so it was obvious. Mold-related illness was so different because I was actually just as sick, maybe more sick, and it didn't have a name. I looked okay on the outside. How would you talk to patients or clients about this experience of being unseed or un, or not understood? So huge because I'm thinking of complex chronic illnesses that you're talking about and thank God you have this incredible I mean, I'm sorry for the suffering and distress and the incredible impact upon your life, but you've really turned it all around to offer this glimmer of faith and and hope to people. And you live through the chronic illness, so you're the best person to talk about it. So thanks. I just want to say shout out to all that. <laughs> and And there are so many pieces to the chronic illness puzzle. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, data and there's feeling. I mean, many people who come to me have the experience of, just as you described, I, I'm not understood, but worse than that, I'm not believed. Yes, yes. Being understood is not being believed. So there's a lot of medical um, dismissal, uh, gaslighting, and it brings us back to the the why we dissociate to begin with, um, because something is so distressing. It's the best way to adapt to the current situation. I think that our our strong and tender bodies and nervous systems don't really know what to do with this chronic. I don't believe you. This doesn't make sense. I don't believe you. You're crazy. Um, and instead of saying, you know, this is really something, I don't know what it is. It's really something. We're going to link arms and together we're going to figure it out. And I know you do that. Yeah. And you too. I, and that's why it's so needed is this, um, it's interesting too, because after we did the premiere in Denver of the film, one of the things we did not expect with feedback from those who came, a lot of people came spouses and some patients of mine and some, you know, we had, we had a wonderful group. And one of the things that came up at least three different people said, wow, I had no idea what my partner, my spouse, my best friend was going through. When I watched this, I started to see what they might be experiencing and it really changed the way I view their illness. And two of them specifically had talked about, I was about to divorce. I was about to separate. I was about to, because I was like done with this. And one of the things we talk about in the movie is, is my own divorce and that trauma. But if I look back at experiencing that, there was a piece of the, that um, separation that came from misunderstanding and illness, just like we're talking about. So I think it's a powerful, hopefully the movie will speak to those. What I would love to see if someone who is suffering watches the movie and then shares it with their friends or family that are maybe not understanding what they're going through and it brings this circle. Are there any other ways you can think of as someone is experiencing complex chronic illness, they feel misunderstood by the medical system, misunderstood by their friends and family? Are there any ways in which they can share or um, get someone alongside of them who really does understand? Mm, such a good question. You know, there are so, like, at least maybe I'm plugged into and my patients are plugged to so many online communities now where there are conversations. I that's feel like a that's a great idea. <laughs> there's so many online communities. And there's also much more, I think there's a wider conversation around inflammatory conditions, uh, long-term infectious. I mean, it feels like it's it's eking its way into mainstream medicine and maybe people now, you know, know about chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, and how that relates to chronic environmental um, sensitivities. I feel like, I mean, the more we talk about it, the better it is. Yeah. But I feel like informing ourselves like reassuring ourselves that indeed these are experiences uh, of fatigue, of listlessness, of joint pain, of headache, of cognitive fog. You know, unfortunately, we know more about it because of COVID. COVID has this long tail that we're all still in mm -hmm. because it affects the brain and it also affects the nervous system. Sometimes it's hard to know um, it's hard to tease apart, but I, I guess what I want to say is that, yes, um, chronic 
chronic illnesses have very often have their roots in nervous system dysregulation. So, you know, my favorite pet topic is get to know your nervous system. And how do we do that? Well, we first start with a willingness and awareness that our autonomic nervous system, the health of our vagus nerve, they all, those all contribute to, so get to know your nervous system. Um, there's simple practices that people can do and study. You can study polyvagal theory, the autonomic nervous system. You can check in with yourself also and go slowly. Trust yourself, you know, trust your own, your, trust your own like intuitive sense. This is real. And I believe it. And find, if you can, one person, one trusted person to actually like land with and say, you know what, I believe you, I trust you, I believe you. But it does start with, you know, honestly, trusting yourself and getting a sense of your own connection with self, I would say is really important. Um, but the link between chronic illnesses and and trauma, and I'm going to put trauma and dysregulated nervous system kind of in the same sentence, because trauma leads to, sure, shifts in neurologic structure and function, but systemically in our whole bodies, we react differently, we feel differently, we respond differently. So I think working on relationships, working on our relational health is good for our nervous system, but also good to engage someone who doesn't gaslight us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that th th those are some of my thoughts around um, how to not feel alone when you have chronic complex illness is really what you're asking about. And Yeah, and I think those are so powerful. I love the practical stuff too. And I love how you brought in the fact that um, it's not just we get dysregulated from trauma and have to deal with that, but it's actually maybe the root cause of some of our complex chronic illness is unresolved trauma. And you touched on that. And I know that on your website, EileenNaomiRust.com, I'll put a plug in here. There's lots and lots of resources there for those kinds of like vagal work. And you are an expert in all things. In fact, you just got off teaching some of this stuff on another um, platform. Um, so there are so many ways where you can engage if you're listening, because it's not just that you have trauma, you have to resolve that from the medical illness. It's this other thing that you're saying that actually, what if the unresolved trauma is actually contributing? And so then we go and start to deal with that. And I love that you brought that in because it's, I really think it's a core as I've done complex chronic illness over decades. What I've seen is the supplements, the lifestyle, the diet, all that's wonderful, but there's another layer here that you're talking about that if you don't address and if you don't feel safe in your body, um, then you're not going to heal. One of the interesting things is when we said, what is this movie going to be about? And it went into multiple variations. But at the end, the producer, director, and I said, BLT, this is what it's about. And the B is believe, believe in yourself. The L is love yourself, that unconditional self-regard and uh, compassion, self-compassion. And the T is um, trust your intuition, which is what you're saying. And what I realized in the journey before and then filming the movie, you can't really love and show yourself compassion until you trust your body to give you signals that are real and and that you can actually trust that feedback that you're getting. So I realized in the journey, you have to first trust your intuition before you can really have that self-compassion. And those things, which again, you're the expert on this, are the ways in which we um, de-escalate that dysregulation of the nervous system and actually change our physiology. So, um, what would, go ahead. Can you say something? That's great. That, that is completely brilliant. I love the BLT. I love it. It's just what we were, we had just been yeah, talking about. Yeah. But I, I, either I heard someone say something yesterday or I read it and it was like, you have to love yourself before anyone else can love you. It was something like that, right? I just want to speak to that because huh? actually I don't believe it just goes that way. I really feel like it's the relational love. Like if you, maybe you can receive love from someone else that you actually don't have for yourself. And then there's like us, maybe a smaller entryway for someone else's love to enter you, but maybe it, it will eke its way in. So I just want to say that you don't, have to come to a place of like self-knowledge and self-awareness and self-enlightenment and and self-love if you allow another to also offer you that then that's another way in 
So this social, emotional, relational state of a positivity and engagement can be so healing. So I, it shouldn't just be between, like you're saying, it's not just about being with yourself in yourself. It's also about creating, and I think that's what you and I have developed over the last 10 or so years, this uh, offering of unconditional yes appreciation acceptance and maybe you don't feel it yourself but you're able to like get this mirror and this mirror neurons going i have the sweetest little study i just read about i know this isn't a scientific talk, but in the talk i just gave there was a picture of a baby with a head uh sorry an eeg cap on uh -huh. reading brain waves and a mother with an eeg cap on from a study done in Cambridge, maybe oh. five. And they showed that when the mother looks at the baby with kind regard and speaks in a lovely voice that's soothing and beautiful, their brain waves synchronize. Wow. Amazing. So imagining like what, what happens when we have this relational attunement to our nervous system, yes. even if great. So it's an invitation to listeners to begin to build meaningful, like connected, interested, curious relationships and allow in love that's there for you, you know? So you have my... just said that's so brilliant and so important. And maybe in the last few minutes, I think it, it's very relevant to our world now with artificial intelligence, with, with us all on screens. And so many people I love, Esther Perel recently said, AI is artificial intimacy. And I love that term. She kind of is switching the AI into this. And the truth is, so many of us think that we're connected. And she also said, you know, we have a thousand friends, but we have no one to take our dog out or to go get groceries for us or to go to the post office, right? And the truth about what you're talking about is like true gaze, like you and I in a clinic with a patient or a friend having coffee or a loved one gazing into the eyes and being in the present with another human, that's such a powerful healing um, that happens there. And unfortunately, many of us now, even now on Zoom, right? Here we are on Zoom and we have to do this to record, but we would get much more powerful healing if we were sitting in front of one another, having coffee and actually looking into each other's eyes. So if you're out there, this might be one of the things that you can actually go and do differently is how do you engage in the world in a real way? And whether it's with your pet or your best friend or your loved one or your child or your parents and really, truly see these people in person, not just on a screen, not just through a text. Would you like to comment on that? Because I think, again, our world is so geared towards um, screens and we're not getting the same physiological um, encouragement to our systems as we are in person. Right now, I'm looking right at your eyes. Do you feel like you're looking right at my eyes? I do. It's really special. I, I mean, I bet if you put a EEG cap on you and me right now, We'd be getting the same results as the Cambridge yeah. study because we're very, we're very connected. All right. Exactly. This kind of connection is different than screening through your thousand friends on social media. This kind of connection is um, caring, engaged. We're noticing the tone of each other's voices, what each other sound like, bouncing back and forth. This kind of connection is beautiful, but the artificial intelligence, the artificial intimacy. Yeah. <laughs> is not to be trusted. And it's very, very concerning because um, I call it, you know, slow medicine. Slow medicine is the medicine of healing our nervous systems with each other, with um, slowing everything down. Like I just took a breath. Yeah, me too. And that's what being with you is always healing to my nervous system because there's just an ease and a, and a relax and a, and a slowness in a really healthy way, like being present. Um, and you do that with me, with all of your clients and with so many people, part of your your voice your <laughs> is healing. You are. <laughs> so, oh, what a pleasure. Um, what, if you could think of maybe one last bit of advice, think about the patient who's, you know, getting ready to walk out the door and maybe they're still a little discouraged or maybe it's just someone listening that's been through a lot and they're like, but what about me? I'm still sick. I still suffer every day. I'm still in a moldy home. Any um, bits of wisdom you could uh, give to the person who feels like there's no hope? Such a very good question. I'm even saying this because there's so much that comes to me and I don't even know there's so many, first of all, take a moment to um, attend 
instead of bypassing, overriding, or expecting there to be this negative imprint that's the same as it was yesterday in the last moldy home, give a moment of possibility and stretch yourself. I have found that with many of my patients, leaning into the fear of it all rather than the mold itself, but the fear of it all, same thing with Lyme, same thing with co-infections, both can exist at once. And I really learned this from my honored work with Ukrainians and Ukrainian refugees. Like I was terrified to work with people who were in the midst of war. How do you do like peri-traumatic healing with people? I... Right? How do you do it? <laughs> One of the important things that I learned and I and I now use in my own life is that two things can be true at once. I know it sounds very simple, but it's like this and. So yes, I'm terrified of mold. I'm terrified to walk into that building and I'm still okay. Like I have two feet. I have one foot that's like stepping into this, I'm going to die realm. Because getting back to this full circle conversation, yes. I think that that's really what it is with these pervasive like lime has a way of taking over um so does mold have a way of taking over in a physiologic sense but also in a, a psychological or psycho spiritual sense if you really want to get um mm -hmm. woo -woo about it it takes the, these things take over that you can't necessarily touch them you feel like they're everywhere pervasive so knowing that that's true yeah. admitting that there's like such deep fear that this will never go away or I will die. Yeah. Leaning into that with the compassion that we're talking about, like the very soft touch around or asking someone else to saying, I'm really terrified. I'm going to die. Knowing also that you have this endogenous built in positive neuroplasticity system that wants you to be okay. That wants you to live. And that actually has the capacity to expand and extend you. Yeah. Oh my God, both are true. So tapping into both while honoring both. Mm. not dishonoring the fear but still accepting i have many parts yeah so I, I i think that that's like that seems to me like and i did learn most of this i have to admit in my work with my a very beloved family member who had extreme ocd that caused him to not be able to leave the house oh, not yeah. that dissimilar from some yeah. of our patients who are so stuck in a yeah. small or a small house or a bedroom yeah. location. You can only go into one room in a house. I mean, so the idea of what will happen if I play gorgeous music, I call my best friend and I say, I'm going to step out of this room. I'm going to use a resource, an ally. And I want to expand, extend and stretch. And that's because I'm building my resilience. So that's my long, simple answer to both things can be true. I, there's a part of me that's really healthy right now, whether that's I can speak or I can walk or I can feel hope, maybe a little part. And also I'm really sick and afraid to die. Just gently having those two parts meet each other and being like, okay. Yeah. You can both exist together. I love that. Cause that's even my own journey with mold. I realized it's um, still stepping out, going to hotels and knowing that I'm probably going to encounter mold mold. And if I do, I'll be okay. Right. Like, and I love giving that gift to patients of saying, you know what? I do this all the time. I sometimes crash and I just know, okay, what do I have resources to do or to fix or to, you know, be okay with this and then know that you, it's a roller coaster. <laughs> and so I love that you're giving people that permission to not feel well and be afraid, but also know somewhere deep inside, wait, I can overcome this. Cause it's that courage that to step forward where they want. Yeah. That's what the movie's all about. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I do. I do. Before we leave, I want to let people know it can be really slow. It could be just yeah. incremental little pieces, but it has to be with a lot of resources, a yeah. lot of gentle and loving and supportive resources. Yeah. And and let me just say publicly, you are my dearest friend. And I know so much of this journey you've experienced with me. And there's so much of the journey where I would not be where I am today without a friend like you to help regulate my nervous system, to help talk through issues. And so you are a professional, you're a brilliant neuropsychologist, but in this way, you are a friend. And in that friendship, you have helped to heal me. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for being a part of my journey in such a profound way.
Thank you, Dr. Jill. Jill, beloved. <laughs> I'm so grateful to you. I'm so grateful to you. I'm so grateful to you. I'm so grateful for what you've opened up in so many people and what this uh, friendship and collegial relationship has done for me, for my patients. And I know that this message is going to be heard far and wide so that people don't feel alone and people yeah. feel you know, it's possible. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for coming on and sharing your heart. Cause I said, like I said, you have so much knowledge to share. And I said, will you please just come and share your heart with me? And I think, I hope that people feel that in, in our, in, in saw our, our amazing lip gloss. Cause we always compare how, what kind of lip gloss <laughs> we're wearing the same color today. <laughs> so it's a great lip gloss. <laughs> to fun. To fun. <laughs> to fun. Oh, bless you, my friend. Beautiful. And I just, I'm so, so joyful that, that today's the day really when this movie is really, you know, being launched. So it's got very exciting that we got to meet today. Yes. Thank you so much.